talking. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Samantha Russell Blumenkernick, the Chief Naturalist at the Eagle River Nature Center. Um, and the Eagle River Nature Center main building remains closed to the public at this time, but our trails are all wide open. We're still renting cabins and yurts, and we're still trying to add or keep programming like this coming to you. Um, and I should say too, we have an amazing trail crew, including Sharon and Dan, who I see are in the audience, who make sure that your decks are uh, shoveled out, that we have access to our latrines, and who are keeping everything going. So extra thank you, Sharon and Dan, and thank you for coming today. Um, as we're going today, this program is going to be recorded and made available on our YouTube channel later on. And so as we do this, if you're somebody who's extra sensitive about being seen, or you don't want the world to know that you exist, um, just make sure to turn off your camera. Um, you're welcome to stay muted throughout the entire thing. Um, as we're doing this today too, we ask that you save your questions until the end. Alicia will have an will give an opportunity for us all to ask. If you're really, really, really worried that you have this amazing question and you're gonna forget it, go ahead and type it in the chat box. Um, but otherwise, we're going to try to save questions um, to be answered all together rather in, than in private conversations today. With that, um, a little bit about Alicia. I have a handy, amazing thing because we were super fortunate to have her offer to present uh, for the Nature Center. She, I reached out after the last bird, birding class we had um, in late November, I think. But... Alicia King is the Alaska Regional Public Affairs Specialist for the USDA Forest Service, and she's the author of the book Orvis Beginner's Guide to Bird Watching. She's hosted a bird feature segment on Discover the Wild for Wyoming Public Broadcasting Services and has co-hosted a season of the National Birdwatch Television Program for PBS, among a number of other super amazing things that I bet she'll talk about. Um, yeah, and with, think with that, I'm gonna say, take it away, Alicia. All right, great. Thanks so much, Samantha, and thank, thanks to Evil, Evil River, not Evil River, Eagle River for um, supporting the, the visitors and the people who come to visit the area. Um, it's organizations like this that really uh, make it possible for people like Samantha to do her job and to be supported from her, by her job. So Bear with me as I go through um, the slides when it actually works. So again, my name is Alicia King. I'm gonna talk about winter bird feeding, specifically in this area around the, the um, South Central area of Alaska. And um, I am going to try to navigate through my slides that don't always wanna cooperate with me. So thanks for joining me today. Um, I know that there are a lot of activities, a lot of things that you could be doing, and so I appreciate your spending time this afternoon to talk a little bit more about uh, bird feeding, and especially winter bird feeding. So I'm not going to focus on, on summertime bird feeding, we're just going to talk about some winter bird feeding, and just the basics. Um, you know, what are some of the Alaska feeder birds that are going to show up at your, at your backyard potentially? Why do we feed birds? What are some bird seed options? So what kind of seeds and feeds should we be feeding to the birds? Feeder varieties, the different birds like different kinds of feeders for different reasons. And so I wanna review some of those. Talk a little bit about feeder placement and then unexpected guests. So are you getting things at your feeders that you didn't invite to come to join you at your feeders? Um, are there things that we can do about some of those, those uninvited guests? And then um, those really, truly uninvited guests, are there things that we can do? And then we're going to go through just a few myth busters. There are lots of myths out there about birds and feeding birds, so I want to kind of talk about those. And then just some fun bird facts. And as Samantha said, we'll hold questions until the end, but chat, you know, type them in the chat if you've got them so that you don't forget um, and that we can be prompted you know, at the end of our session. So... Winter bird feeding is a lot of fun um, because winter can be quite um, white. The, the background that I have that you're seeing behind me is my backyard. And there's, if you can see, there's a bull moose in my backyard in this photo, um, but it's where I hang most of my feeders and put most of my backyard attracting bird type things. And so in the winter, we don't have as many birds as we do in the spring, summer, and fall. So birds aren't actively migrating. 
um, as they are in the spring and fall, and then they're not um, nesting as they are in the summer. So winter is kind of slow with birds. About 31 land bird species spend their winter in Alaska. Most of those are grouse, owls, and woodpeckers, about 18 species. And then as you get farther away from the coast, it's a little harder to find birds. So when you're by the water sources or by um, the warmer, where the warm currents come through, it's a little easier to find birds. And when I talk about birds migrating, it's not that birds, um, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service calls migratory birds migratory birds. So most all of the birds that you are going to see in North America are considered migratory birds. Some of them are long distance and some of them are short distance. And some of that depends on food sources, water sources, and, and habitat conditions as to whether they go a shorter distance or a longer distance or a really long distance. And so species are, are counted uh, in a number of ways. And the, the Christmas bird count in central Alaska seldom reaches 20 bird species. And those um, bird, Christmas bird counts are dominated by common ravens, uh, the black cap chickadees, boreal chickadees, and common red poles. So those are really frequent visitors to our bird feeders in the, in the winter time. And so a lot of people ask, well, why feed the birds? So birds are active and, and around in the winter time during the times that we are. So um, of course, as I look out my window in the dark, I'm up at, you know, six o'clock in the morning and I'm not seeing any birds out there. But once the sun starts to come up, the birds start to become active. Having feeders brings birds close. So being able to see them up close is awfully fun to be able to see their habits, the fun things that they do, the way that they behave, the way that they sometimes bicker. And it looks like kids, you know, fighting over bird seed or what a position on the feeder or whatever. Um, birds are pretty easy to observe. They're, um, you know, especially if you bring them up close with your feeder. And it's just, it can be a lot of fun. And so um, I want to share just a little video with you. Samantha and I tried this video and it worked. Okay. All right. So way to, way to start off this presentation. Let me... Um, so I just wanted to share the video with you. And, and I don't know if you can see it very well or hear it very well, but this is the back, my backyard view. And I just, I cannot share with you enough how fun it is to see these birds coming in and out, listening to them chick, chickadee dee ding and, and um, hanging out with me. I eat my breakfast, lunch, and dinner at this table. And I'm able to, you know, when it's light enough outside and they're, they're coming in and out, this is, this is kind of my view and what I see. And we'll walk through a little bit more of some of the um, the other things that I have in my backyard and that I'm that I'm seeing, and so let's see. So, okay, now Samantha, here's my quandary. I am. There we go. Are we on the next slide that says our Alaska backyard birds? We are. Excellent. <laughs> okay, so. Um, one of the things to watch for when you're feeding the birds is to be able to um, pay attention to their, their features. So what do their head looks like? What do their beaks, their bills look like? What do their feet look like? And what's the basic body structure and their tails? Tell a lot about what you'll, you're gonna see at your feeders or what kind of feeders they're attracted to, what kind of seed they're attracted to. So um, this can be a clue as to what kind of bird feeders you need to put out and what bird seed you need to put out. And it sounds like a lot of you already get this. You've already got bird feeders out. Um, maybe you don't have a lot of birds co coming to your feeder or maybe, maybe you do. So as I walk through some of these slides, maybe we'll be able to um, kind of target and pinpoint what might be going on at your feeders. So the bird in the upper right is a downy, male downy woodpecker coming to a suet feeder. And I'll talk more about the different kinds of seeds and suet. The lower left is a white ring crossbill. Its bill is designed specifically for cracking open seeds and pine cones and, and spruce cones and those sorts of things. And it's, it's a wicked beak, but it's also able to crack open sunflower seeds and other types of um, food that you have at your bird feeder. Little chickadee, bold, 
um, will, will come in many situations, often one of the first birds that you find at your bird feeder um, because they're so inquisitive and so curious. And then the pine siskin on the far right, um, lower right, is a tiny little bird. Uh, Samantha mentioned niger seed or fin finch feeders. That's what they seem to be attracted to. Their tiny little bill um, is easily uh, adapts to eating, eating um, different kinds of bird seeds, but they really like the, the niger seed. So there are a lot of different seeds out there and a lot of different ways to feed birds. And one of the things that I wanna share with you as a myth buster is that birds do not depend on us to feed them. So when you hear people say, oh, I can't start feeding the birds because they'll, they, you know, they'll starve if I stop feeding, that is a myth. While um, they may go elsewhere if, you're, if you stop feeding the birds or you um, go on vacation and stop feeding the birds for a month or two, they may go someplace else and because your feeders are empty and it might take them a while to come back to your feeder. So that could make you sad. So once you start feeding the birds, it's nice to consistently do it because they'll consistently come back, but they are not dependent on you to feed, to feed them. And studies show that only up to 20% of their daily food intake is, can be human provided. And so they're not waiting around for you to feed them. They will go elsewhere to find food. So the different kinds of bird seed that we can um, feed birds. There's a lot, when I go to the grocery store, I see a lot of mixes and a lot of blends and I stay away from those because they have things in them that I'll talk about in just a second, but um, things that, that the birds aren't that interested in eating. So there's a lot of people who do a lot of research and study on what birds eat. One of the, the best bird feeds you can seeds that you can put out to feed your birds is oil sunflower seed. By far, it's the cheapest for the amount of um, food that you get. So it has a high oil content and a high calorie content, which is what you want to provide to the birds. So um, the oil sunflower seed, that black oil sunflower seed, there's striped sunflower seed, not as high flower or um, oil content and not as many calories. And it's typically grown for human consumption. So the oil sunflower grown for um, birds and oil has, has a high oil content. And it sometimes can come as chips just uh, without sunflower seed without the shells. On the lower left, you'll see safflower seed, which um, is also something birds will eat. It's got a little bit of a bitter taste, but still a high um, oil content. Safflower oil is made out of safflower seeds. It tends not to be as liked by um, squirrels and other mammals and um, blackbirds. So, so it's something that people put out to, to um, kind of discourage those blackbirds and those squirrels from eating from their feeders. On the lower right, millet. Millet is something that is um, not as high oil content and not as high protein, but it's great for some of the smaller birds and some of the ground feeding birds. So um, red poles will eat it, juncos will eat it, um, different kinds of sparrows will eat it. So it's a good one to think about when you're, when you're deciding on what kind of bird seed to eat, to feed your birds. Um, some fun things to add into the mix, um, niger seed, that's thistle seed grown specifically for feeding birds. Those tiny little slivers fit in a special feeder, which I will show you. And then peanuts are great to feed birds. Um, mealworms are fun to feed, except, uh, especially insect eating birds. And then down on the right, I don't know if you can see my little, my little frowny face um, beside the word Milo, but Milo is something that studies show birds don't really like to eat. It's typically left at the end. They pick out all the good stuff and then that's left on the ground and um, it, you know, just makes your bird feeding area particularly messy. So um, if you've been feeding with a blend and you notice that there's a lot of stuff on the ground, it may be because it has a lot of Milo seed in it. One of the other myths or the myth buster that I wanna share with you is that of all those seeds that I shared with you, Birds don't find their food by smell. They find it by sight and habitat characteristics. So they, they're looking for habitats that fit their needs. They're looking for um, ways that they can feed themselves, find water. You know, there are four basic things that birds need, food, water, shelter, and places to raise their young. And so 
The bird that does have a great sense of smell is a vulture, and we're not inviting the vulture to be at our feeders. So um, unless you want to attract a, a, a vulture, <laughs> which you could put some roadkill out for them, I guess, but um, birds don't really have a keen sense of smell at all, so they're not going to smell your bird seed or your feeders. Um, basic uh, bird feeders, and Samantha, I can't remember how many people in the poll said that they have a basic wooden platform feeder, but this is the... Do you I'm remember? sorry, I was going to say, I think most of the people. Yeah, okay. Yes. Um, it's a common feeder, and so it's a great feeder because it services a wide variety of, of birds. Um, this little chickadee has come in, found a seed, sit, sitting there before it takes off. This platform kind of situation allows the birds to sit, pick out the seeds they want, and then, and then fly away. It has enough of a cover on it that it helps protect not only the seed from getting perhaps wet, but um, also the birds while they're eating the seed. And then wooden feeders and platform feeders sometimes have additional um, availability of suet and um, suet feeders or peanut feeders or things that they, you know, that go onto the side of it that just, again, help um, attract that wide variety. The second most popular type of feeder is a tube feeder. It tends to be my favorite. I really like it because the chickadees really like it. Um, that, and that's the feeder in the green on the right hand side. The yellow feeder is a finch feeder and it has a very small opening. So it's really um, allows smaller birds to reach their tiny bills in there to get the seed and really discourages birds with larger um, beaks. So gross bills, even the um, cross bills, the, um, you know, those larger types of birds have a harder time getting into that little tiny opening and getting the little tiny seed out. Uh, so th these two most common attract probably the largest variety of birds when we're talking about feeding birds. So seed eaters will come to them. Many of these birds are also insect eaters. The finches are probably in the family that um, are mostly seed eaters. And a lot of the other perching birds, birds that are able to perch, um, are um, also seed eaters. So the chickadee, red-breasted nuthatch, um, black-capped chickadee are all birds that will come into these platform feeders and these um, tube feeders that hang. So um, I'll talk a little bit about um, some of the more characteristics of some of these feeders as I go through this presentation. But some of the birds um, don't like tube feeders necessarily. Um, and might not even come to a platform feeder that's high. They like to, or they're more comfortable feeding on the ground. And that's where the sunflower chips and the um, millet come into play. That if you scatter that on the ground or it just falls from your feeder, um, feed those birds that are a little more comfy on the ground as opposed to being at, at the feeder. And so I notice in particular the common red pole um, it's fun to watch them actually, because they'll come in as though they're gonna come into the tube feeder and they're like, yeah, no, you know what? I'm just gonna go down to the ground. So, um, you know, their behavior tells me where they're most comfortable. And you can purchase a, a platform feeder that um, sets off of the ground, but acts like it's on the ground so that the birds are up off of the snow or off of your deck or wherever, um, but still able to get bird seed. And so part of the fun thing about feeding birds, and remind me again, Samantha, how many people said they have suet feeders? Minus the one person who said they had a suet feeder, but I don't think they really do. <laughs> Let's see, officially 12. Excellent, excellent. 80, 80. So Okay, so you guys know how much fun it is to watch the different kinds of birds come in and eat the suet. And suet is um, rendered beef fat. You can purchase blocks of it just in the regular grocery store or other specialty stores. And I, again, what I recommend with the suet is not to get something that has a lot of seed in it because you're attracting the insect eaters. And so go with a peanut feeder uh, or a peanut suet, 
um, or a, a plain suet block even, just you know, plain suet. If it has a lot of the Milo or the millet in it or cracked corn, you might end up attracting some things that you might not want to attract. And it's you'll find that you end up with a lot of gunk that hasn't been eaten by those birds because that's not really what they're interested in. They're interested in the beef, in the suet. And um, so, you know, keeping your seed pure and keeping your suet as pure as possible based on the birds that you want to attract and the birds that you know you're going to attract, you'll have a lot less mass and a lot uh, less to worry about when you're feeding these birds. So they'll come in, pick the suet, pick the pieces that they want, and, um, and you'll oftentimes also see them wiping their bill on the on the suet feeder or going to a twig and wiping their bill just to get the fat off. And one of the things as you're considering what to put in your um, feeder, and I'll, I'll just note on the right is a feeder that a friend of mine made for me. And, um, and I love it dearly because it symbolizes, a, you know, a log, which is where these birds to go find their natural food source, where they go, you know, to find their insects or, or whatnot. And so it's just fun to see them come in and use their, you'll notice this um, chickadee, this boreal chickadee is using its tail as a tail prop to prop itself as it digs into that suet. And so as far as suet goes, again, you can get blocks at the, at the store, which is, is perfectly fine to put suet in. You can render it yourself, get some, some suet from the butcher. You can also use peanut butter. And a myth bister, buster about suet is that, or about peanut butter rather, is that birds won't really choke on peanut butter. It does, you know, it can be sticky. It's not um, known to choke them, but um, putting a little bit of cornmeal or putting a little bit of seed in it can kind of you know, help break that up. Um, choose a peanut butter that has um, no sugar or other additives. Low salt is best because you don't want birds to be eating an awful lot of salt, but it does um, enable them to you know, be able to eat the peanut butter and it's, it helps make the peanut butter last a little longer than just putting plain peanut butter in your suet feeder. So there's all sorts of specialty feeders. Oh my gosh, it is so fun to think of all of the different things that you can do with your bird food feeding area. Um, so putting peanuts in a peanut feeder, putting um, on the far right there in the green is a peanut feeder. And then the feeder in the middle has a round um, circle at the bottom of it and where the birds can sit and, and get their seed. If a heavy bird sits on that ring, it closes it so they can't access the bird seed. And then the feeder on the far left is um, a mealworm feeder. So being able to put mealworms in a feeder for some of your insect eating friends is so fun. Um, just you can use uh, live mealworms if you want, just keep them in your fridge and put them out every day when you think the chickadees are gonna be around. And then, um, or you can use dried mealworms. They'll, they'll eat those as well. This is just a different kind of peanut butter feeder. It has, it's a smaller mesh and you put um, shelled peanuts in it and the birds can come and break the peanuts and then take little peanut pieces out of it. This is a female downy woodpecker on the feeder. The dome over it is not really a squirrel proof dome and I'll talk a little bit about that later, but um, it does help protect again, the seed or the peanuts that are in that feeder and just you know gives a little reprieve to the to the birds as they're coming to the to, to that particular feeder. Cages can be put around birds if you want to keep the bigger birds out and invite just the small birds. And this feeder on the far right um, has a top that is not a squirrel proof top, but if you lower it low enough, it will keep the larger birds out and um, allow just the smaller birds in. So make it more exclusive to the smaller birds. Take a look at this picture. Look at the bill on this nut hatch. Notice anything funny about it? I'm going to talk about that in a minute. So there's just a picture of a chickadee inside. It can just go right into that cage and then it doesn't have to worry about ravens or crows or other birds that might be coming to your feeders that you probably didn't invite. And so another myth buster for you is that birds don't freeze or stick to metal feeders or to bird baths. They don't have the um, to simplify it, they don't have the blood circulation in their feet the way that we do. It's not flush there, and so they don't stick to metal. Um, 
there's been a, one or two rare cases, I think, where birds have stuck. They've perhaps been in a bird bath and then headed over to metal, and it's the water on their feet that froze to the metal. Um, and so that's why people sometimes will put met, um, plastic caps over their bird feeders. So one really fun way to get birds to come up close to you is to put a window feeder in your window. And so bringing them up close allows you to really have a bird's eye view of what they're looking, what they look like and how they eat their seeds. They come in, take the seed, crack it open. Um, they're just, it's absolutely fascinating to watch them up that close. And so one of the things um, you probably get, the chickadees are probably one of my favorite birds bird seeding, bird feeding seed, uh, birds, but they actually weigh their seed. So birds will come, the chickadees will come in, not that other birds don't do this, but studies have shown chickadees come in and you might see them pick up a seed, put it down, pick up another seed, put it down. And they've, you know, they or they start tossing it around or, you know, moving it around. They're actually hunting for the heaviest bird seed. So they will get, get the biggest bird seed, and then take it back, put it between their feet, break it open, and eat it. And one of the ways that um, folks discovered this was that they put um, little, they put plaster of Paris of var varying weights into sunflower shells, put them out on the um, bird feeders, and then noticed which ones the birds were taking. Now you can imagine the surprise of the bird when it got back to its branch and found not seed meat in its feed, in its seed that it cracked open. But that's how they discovered that the birds actually weigh what they, what they eat. So I mentioned uninvited guests. Um, and one of the things, Samantha, we didn't ask was, um, do you feed the squirrels? Some people love to feed the squirrels. They enjoy watching their antics and, and just, you know, hanging out with the squirrels. I'm not a fan of feeding squirrels and, um, you know, I don't mind if they come and get a little bit of the leftovers of the bird feeders, but I, I try not to encourage them. I especially do not feed them out of my hand, and I especially do not feed them at my back door so that they know that there's food coming out of my house into their mouth. Um, they can be pretty pesky, and I just prefer not to have them that close to, to my kitchen or to my house. Um, there are baffles, ways that you can keep them from coming onto your feeder. So a nice big round dome on top of your feeder or a cylinder dome um, underneath a pole that you've placed your feeder on um, can help keep these squirrels away. They have a great sense of smell and so they will smell whatever you're putting out for dinner and um, this guy on the right is looking up at the feeder that's hanging up above him and so far he hasn't been able to jump that high to reach my feeder. But some of the other uninvited guests might be accidentals that visit your yard, such as a sharp-shinned hawk or a goshawk. Um, if you have chickens, you're probably really aware of these birds of prey that come and hang out with you or hang out and looking at your feeders. We have actually noticed um, that sharp-shinned hawks and cooper's hawks a little farther south are um, hang out at feeders. They actually know that there are gonna be little birds visiting at the feeder and um, they know that that's a food source for them. That's something that they've learned. So the best thing that you can do to kind of discourage these birds, look at him, he's like, who me? So the best thing that you can do to discourage these birds um, is to create a safe haven for your birds that you do want to attract. So putting your feeders close to perhaps a, an evergreen bush or uh, maybe a brush pile that is a place where they can um, fly to seek refuge from the, um, you know, from the, the birds of prey that are out there. So these uninvited guests are quite crafty and um, are definitely something that, um, that is a natural thing. It's, it's just definitely natural for them to come to these areas and, and find, you know, whether it's the voles or squirrels or, or the birds, um, you know, it's just something that the birds are, are um, I don't want to say used to, but it's something that happens. Um, one of the birds that I noticed a lot of reportings of a couple weeks ago, about two or three weeks ago, and Samantha, I don't know if you got this at your nature center, but people were seeing shrikes. And um, 
the these little birds look so sweet and innocent. I mean, look at him. He's so sweet and innocent looking, but look at his bill. It is quite wicked. And he is um, a big insect eater, but will also eat small birds. And so I had a shrike, this shrike indeed, um, that you see pictured here, hanging out at my bird feeders for about a week, um, just waiting to see if he could dine on anything that happened to come to pick up seed underneath my feeder, like a vole or, or a mouse or whatever, um, or even the birds at my bird feeder. Um, so brush piles and greenery help to find uh, help birds find places that help um, you know reduce their likelihood of getting chomped on by one of these birds. So some of the other things that you might see at your feeder that um, that I consider to be welcome guests. Uh, brown creeper on the left, hard to tell the difference between the bark and that brown, that, um, that creeper, but they um, creep along the bark and they go up and then fly down and come back up. This one is headed toward a little pile of suet that has been smeared on the bark of the tree. And so um, I highly encourage you to take a little bit of suet or peanut butter bark or something, put it in the, the little crevices of, the, of your tree in a place where you can see it and then see if it, you can attract these, these um, brown creepers to your, to your bird feeding area. On the right, a gray jay, really fun. I know people call these gray jays camp robbers. I like having them come and they particularly are fond of peanuts and um, they'll eat sunflower seeds as well, but they're just fun to watch. And uh, magpie on the lower right, I like magpies. I just think they're absolutely gorgeous and um, a lot of fun to watch. And they'll come and take the peanuts um, from, my, uh, from my deck. I haven't gotten them to eat it out of my hand yet, but they will eat it from, from the deck. So one of the jays that I really like a whole lot is stellar jay. And I have a, a number of them that come and hang out with me. And I just wanna show you a video. And Samantha, I'm, I'm gonna ask everybody again to bear with me to see if we can get this to work. Um, so this is obviously not winter time. I gotta tell you guys, I love Alaska. I'm a little bit of a fair weathered Alaskan. So when it's really cold and, and icy out there, um, I tend to stay in more than not, which is why I really like bird feeding in the winter time. So I'm gonna try this video and see if it works. And so that is the jay coming to feed peanuts. Were you guys able to see that? Yes, it looked super fun. <laughs> so it took us quite a while to get this bird to the point where it would trust to, um, to take the peanuts out of, out of my hands. And it is fun watching them. We had about four of them the other day. And one of them was being very greedy. And I had put some uh, shelled peanuts out as well as the peanuts in the shell. And these birds fill their crop. So they put a peanut in, stick it down, and then, you know, it's in their throat. Um, and then they'll pick up another peanut, cram it down their throat as far as they can. And then they'll try to pick up a third peanut. Well, this particular bird took a big peanut, put it in its crop, picked up a peanut with no shell, put it in, and then tried to pick up a peanut in a shell. So sandwich in between the two peanuts in the shell was the one out of the shell. And every time he bent over to pick up the peanut, the shelled peanut would fall out of his mouth and he would look at it and pick it back up again and then try to go for the peanut in the shell. And he must have done this four or five times. It was hysterical to watch. And so, I, you know, as you can tell, it's just, oops, sorry, didn't mean to click that again. It is so fun to watch them come in to the, the feeding area. So um, earlier I, I shared a, a photo, the one in the left of the nuthatch with a really long bill. That is not a normal bill. So um, sometimes we see this. Um, it's been noted in chickadees in particular, they have deformed beaks. And in this nuthatch, I'm not sure what his story is, but unusually long, it's usually about half that size. So. I, I point this out because you may see this at your feeder and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, always willing to take your call to say that you've seen this and they can report it to folks who do this kind of research. 
Some people think it's deformity because of perhaps pesticides or chemicals that maybe they've been exposed to. Other people think it might be a virus that um, just happens to cause beak deformities. And so it's, um, it's interesting to watch for. And I'm gonna share this video with you. And I'm glad that videos are working or they seem to. Take a look at the Stellar Jay that comes regularly to my house. And again, this is from summertime, but this bird just visited me yesterday. And um, it's been coming to my yard for three years now. Um, and it comes since summer, spring, winter, and fall. And it, I want you to take a look at it and see if you notice anything peculiar about it. You can see it when it turns sideways. And just look at the difficulty it has kind of picking up that peanut. Its lower bill is longer than its upper bill and its upper bill looks like it has been damaged somehow um, or maybe it, it grew that way. And we've noticed that over these last couple um, years, the bill in the bottom has curled up a little bit more than before. So, um, so interesting. So keep an eye out for that. It just, um, one of the things that I always think about is, you know, are they going to be able to survive? Are they going to be able to find enough food? And clearly this one has. It um, doesn't eat a lot of our peanuts. It just comes, you know, every couple days, but it um, clearly has been able to deal with its deformity. And just so you can see there. <laughs> we call her Beaky. <laughs> so I just want to review a couple of the important tips and just cover on some things that I may have forgotten um, with all my being flustered about my slideshow not working properly. Um, so there are some things to think about as you are um, preparing your bird feeding area, um, keeping it clean is really important. So not only keeping the ground and area around you clean, just so that things don't get seed um, shells and things don't get moldy. Um, oil sunflower seed can uh, sometimes eliminate other things from growing in that area. So if you're trying to grow flowers or things underneath where you put your feeders, the sunflower shells um, will keep those things from growing. The um, feeders, it's important to keep your feeders clean. You know, make sure that every once in a while you dump it out. One of the things that I've noticed is I can look out at my feeder and I see that it's three quarters of the way or a quarter of the way full. So only one hole is available and the birds start getting flustered. And then when I go to look at it, it has some debris and kind of junk at the bottom of it. And so they're not really getting seed. So dump that out every once in a while, clean your feeders before you store them at the end of the season. Um, uh, you know, just making sure that you keep that home environment clean for them so that they're not, um, you know, in, a, in a, a dirty environment where they could be spreading disease or, um, you know, causing other issues. Uh, provide shelter from predators. So creating a, a brush pile or putting um, feeders close, relatively close to a, um, an evergreen or some kind of tree that allows them to, you know, to escape potential predators. And when I talk about predators, I'm talking about natural predators. Another thing that you can do is keep your cat indoors. Cats are not natural and native and they don't belong outdoors and they are a huge problem for birds. So um, keeping your cat indoors where it belongs is the best thing you can do to help keep cats safe. And if your neighbor is not um, keeping their cat indoors, you could say something to them. Um, it's, you know, I chase cats away from my feeding area. Uh, because they don't, they're, they're definitely unwelcome in my bird feeding area. Um, place clo feeders close enough to the windows so that um, the birds, if they're fleeing the feeder for any reason, if they get startled, so when they um, are fleeing the window, they don't, or fleeing the feeder, they don't fly into your window really hard. Um, you know, a tiny little thunk might not be an issue, but if your feeders are so far away that when they get startled or they're escaping a predator and they smack into your window, that can be harmful. While they may get up and fly away, most studies show that they don't survive those window hits. Um, and I do have a slide. I'm going to talk about that just in just a little bit. And then position your feeders so that you can enjoy them. You know, make sure that you have a... Um, 
the availability. I mean, you're, this is, your, this is my hobby. And darned if when I put up a suet feeder, um, they go to the backside and I don't see them as well. So I have started only filling one side of the suet feeder, so the side that I can see from my window, so that um, you know it brings them up close and enables me to be able to see them close up. Um, and then make filling the bird feeder easy. So if you buy a bird feeder that's really hard to clean or to take care of or to fill, might be less likely to enjoy it. And then one of the things that I want to make sure that I mention is that um, I don't feed the birds all year round. As much as I would like to, I prefer the natural habitat in the, in the spring, summer, and fall uh, because bears are around. I have black bears in my area. I see evidence of them. I've seen them in my yard. And I'm not going to invite them to my bird feeders. Um, so I highly recommend that you put your bird feeders away in the fall and um, I mean, put them up in the fall, put them away in the spring when birds are active um, or bears are active. So no need to invite them and, and cause any, any kind of trouble. So there are a lot of things that you can do to help birds. I mentioned birds um, smacking into windows. These are silhouettes that I have on my window and you can see it's highly reflective. So um, birds don't have a sense of glass. They don't see that it's a, you know, they go, oh, that, look, that's a window. Stay away from that. They'll just smack into it, especially if you have plants on the inside of your house or that they see the reflection of the trees or plants outside of your house. So if you break up that image, it helps them to recognize that something's there and they are, it signals them to stay away from it. Um, drinking bird-friendly coffee can be a way to help the birds. Eating cocoa chocolate that has been raised um, in bird-friendly habitats. So shade-grown coffee, shade-grown cocoa beans. Um, keeping your cat indoors. I love cats um, when they're indoors and the, where, they, where they belong. Um, so those are some basic things that you can do just to help birds out. And there are a lot of resources out there that can help you figure out what's at your bird feeder. When is it gonna be at your bird feeder? Um, you know, when are they in the area? How far do they migrate? This Aaron Bowman um, created this Anchorage area um, checklist, which for the majority of folks on this call or this presentation, I think would be, um, would be seeing uh, the birds that are here um, in the, it, when it indica indicates that it's wintertime viewing for these birds. And then there's all sorts of basic bird resources, um, ID books, behavior books, there's um, color-coded maps that help you figure out when and where the birds are, help you figure out the habitats, um, you know, how you can situate yours to, to really um, get the most enjoyment out of, out of your, your bird feeding area and your bird feeding hobby. And the big thing is have fun with bird feeding. So, you know, there are some things in your home that you can use to turn into bird feeders, even if you don't have a bird feeder. And maybe get some sunflower seed at the store, some popcorn, some cranberries, um, you know, just decorate your trees out there with them. You know, see how it goes, see how fun it is. Have grandchildren, nephews, nieces that you want to kind of keep busy, watch a movie, string some popcorn, hang it out for the birds. And then coming up in February is the Great Backyard Bird Count. It's the same weekend as Valentine's Day, so you can love your birds and you can um, help citizen science, um, help people count birds. So how do we know where, how many birds there are? What are the most common birds? Where are the birds? What are some of the things happening with birds? You can help be a part of um, how the Cornell Lab of Ornithology and other um, organ conservation organizations keep track of birds um, to help us know about them and you know how, to, how can we protect them and how can we make sure that we continue to enjoy them in our lifetime and in our, in our ch uh, children's futures. So again, sorry for the, um, <laughs> for the, the awful beginning of this uh, slide presentation where you won't be able to move through my slides. Um, but I do want to take a few moments to um, allow you to ask some questions or um, share some information that you might have about the birds that you enjoy. Sharp shinned again here, um, white winged crossbills, a common red pole up in the far right, and then a robin. I didn't really talk about robins. Um, they're not long distance migrants, but boy, um, they are fun to invite to your bird bath in particular. They will eat mealworms and 
in hard times when they can't find much else, they've been known to eat um, bird seed. So I am going to stop there, Samantha, and let's see what we've got from folks who have joined us today. I think one of the first questions that came up in the chat um, from Amy is, are thistle seeds from noxious, from the noxious weed, like bull thistle, or do we need to worry about invasives or anything like that? Um, thank you for that question. And the answer is no. Niger seed, thistle seed, is um, specifically grown for feeding birds and it's treated, it's heat treated before it gets sent um, out to feed the birds. So it is not wild harvested um, uh, noxious weed. And then one of the other questions that just came up in the chat um, was, um, do Stellar's Jays eat bird's eggs, Pam asked. <laughs> so yes, they can eat bird eggs, um, as do other birds. So um, that cute little squirrel that I showed you in that picture, also eats bird eggs. Um, another reason I try not to encourage them to come into my bird feeding area. But um, jays, all the jays will eat, um, could potentially eat bird, other bird eggs. Um, and I'm trying to think some of the, uh, the, and most of the other birds, insect eaters that I've shared with you today are not big egg, um, egg eaters, but um, they, that's one of the reasons that birds become so secretive when they're building their nests and become very quiet. If you notice in the springtime as they're um, courting their, their um, sweeties and then building their nest or you know putting a nest in a birdhouse, after they've done that, they become very quiet. And it's because they don't wanna be obvious or be, um, be seen. They, you know, try to keep, keep, keep out of the limelight, so to speak, so they're not visible. There are a handful of some other questions coming in. Michael has two great questions. Um, and then I also invite members of the audience to unmute themselves and ask, please be kind, loving, gentle in your language and your timing. Um, but um, does suet freeze? So um, yes, suet can freeze. And so, but which is fine because the birds will kind of, you know, the birds like the downy woodpecker in particular and those um, nut hatches even have the bills that allow them to drill into it and get what they need from it. So um, I keep pure suet in my freezer until I'm ready to put it in my feeder and then I bring it out and let it warm up a little bit, put it in my feeder and then stick it back in the freezer. Nice. And then the other question from Michael is, he's heard tales of corvids leaving gifts near feeders as a trade. Have you ever seen this? <laughs> so I have never witnessed this personally. I'm dying to. Um, but I, I do hear of this. I hear that, um, you know, eat magpies will do this. Uh, gray jays will do this. I've heard of stellar jays doing it. So yeah, I think one of the thoughts is that they they really are fond of shiny things or they're very curious and they'll pick things up and then they fly over to an area and they're like, oh, bird seed, oh, peanuts. And then they drop what it is that they're carrying and then um, we'll go to the bird feeder. So yeah, you could look at it as trading. In that vein, um, there's a really great podcast that's um, sometimes PG-13 with language. I'll post a link that spends a half hour talking to a researcher um, specifically about Corvid funeral rituals. And I'll post that link just in there, but that's super interesting. Um, Pam a couple of times has made sure with peanut butter that we are aware um, to not use peanut butter with our birds or with our dogs that contain xylitol because that can be a toxic substance. Um, ah, interesting. Thanks for sharing that, Pam. And as you saw my picture of the peanut butter that I feed my family, um, it's organic and low salt and no sugar added. <laughs> so I, I treat my birds the same way I treat me and my family. <laughs> no high blood pressure for birds. No. Um, <laughs> um, Tanner asks, for suet, is it better to have that attached to a tree or something more or something more stable than in a cage that is hanging and can swing around, or does it matter? Ah, so um, it, I don't want to say that it doesn't matter, except that one of the things, you know, birds are very adept at um, 
finding that stability. And they have that, that tail, um, as I noted with the boreal chickadee on the suet feeder that helps support them. One of the things that a swinging feeder can sometimes do is discourage other birds um, from staying on that feeder. So, uh, you know, if you've got a, a crow or a bird, you know, that's, that's annoying you, that might not be as exciting to them. But the woodpeckers and the nuthatches don't seem to mind the suet kind of moving around a little bit. So um, they'll find that stability with their tails. And um, basically it's where can you see the birds and enjoy them? So put the feeder where it, where it works for you, where it's easy for you to fill and you're gonna keep, you know, keep up with it. So one of the things, Samantha, that I forgot to mention when I was talking about peanuts, um, and actually you guys, I mean, we could talk about this all day long. <laughs> could talk about all these things, creating habitat, feeding or wa putting water out for the birds and so forth. But um, peanuts, if you're going to feed peanuts to your birds, the peanut should be cooked or heated, baked, roasted peanuts. Um, they raw uh, peanuts have a trypsin inhibitor in them, so it inhibits the digestion of protein for the birds. So don't feed raw pe peanuts. If you're going to do peanuts, unsalted um, roasted peanuts are the best thing that you can feed the birds if you want to feed peanuts. Nice. I was noted early on too that I neglected to put um, peanut feeding as an option in the bird feeding poll. So okay. <laughs> for our next bird feeding presentation, I'm going to have a way more robust poll. <laughs> And you can't take all the blame for that, Samantha. Samantha shared the polls with me. And I was like, oh, those look good. <laughs> Let's see. And I'm just scrolling through again. Um, fabulous audience members, feel free to unmute yourselves and ask out loud or continue asking. I just want to make sure that we've gotten um, all of the questions that we asked as we were going on. Uh, we were super fortunate to have Melinda from Tennessee join us. So thank you for coming outside of Alaska. Oh, how fun. Uh, so she's going to see a little bit of different birds than we are. She's going to see more than we are. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, one of the things that I failed to mention, Samantha, was that the pictures that you see, you, that you saw in my presentation, um, the majority of those were mine. Uh, some of them I stole with permission from an organization called Wild Birds Unlimited. And so Wild Birds Unlimited caters specifically to bird feeding and nature enthusiasts. And I worked there for about 15 years as their manager of their original store and then as their nature and cause related marketing director, um, where I was able to do a lot of fun things with our partners like Cornell Lab of Ornithology. But a couple of the pictures, if you saw really crisp, beautiful, brightly colored pictures, those were from Colin Tyler, who is at the um, Eagle River Nature Center. So um, the robin was his, the white winged crossbills were his, and um, I think there was uh, one or two other ones that were his. So thank you to Colin for contributing those to the slide presentation. Excellent. If he were here, he'd say thank you right back for doing this. Um, and Alicia actually exposed a gap in our records. We realized after she asked us for some pictures around um, from a, the Nature Center bird feeders that we haven't taken pictures of birds at the feeder since 1986. And we should be doing that. But for us, when we're taking pictures, we're either, you know, in the building working with people or we're like, finally get by a couple of minutes to go way out on the trails and go far away from the main building, we it didn't even occur to us. So new project, we're gonna keep better track of what's going on at our feeders. <laughs> Let's see, oh, a lot of people saying thank you, um, great job. Um, oh, Chelsea asks, do ponds help attract birds? So yes, um, ponds can help to attract birds. So water is a huge attractant. And because we, it, remember I said, we could just talk forever about birds and attracting birds. And so I focused on bird feeding and not the um, other things that you can attract other than saying food, water, shelter, places to raise young. And water is a huge attractant for birds. So um, water is something that, um, will attract birds more than bird feeding actually will. And especially if you have moving water. And so um, 
note to all of you out there on this presentation, Chelsea is the one who made the bird, the uh, suet feeder for me out of the log. <laughs> So, and they have a beautiful pond in their backyard that's incredibly attractive to birds. And so I highly encourage you to consider a water source in your backyard. Um, I have one that I only operate in the spring and summer and fall and then put it away for the winter. Um, but I have a heated bird bath that I put out and uh, it's fun watching the birds come in and take baths and splash around. I mean, even in this cold, they're out there using the water and um, bathing. So one of the things, just a fun thing, is that birds have to have clean feathers in order to keep warm. So um, they, you know, when you see them all puffed up, you know, our typical reaction is, oh, that poor cold little bird. But actually the bird's fluffing up its feathers and making air pockets, which helps keep it warm. So with clean feathers, it does a much better job of being able to insulate itself and keep itself warm. Oh, fantastic. Um, I have a couple of people saying that they're going back outside to be hand feeding their nut hatches and chickadees with unsalted roasted peanut pieces. <laughs> it is so fun. <laughs> it's so fun. Well, fantastic. Oh, and Chelsea says, nice to see you. <laughs> you too. I, I, you know, this is a fun time that we're able to, um, you know, share these kinds of presentations and be able to see people, you know, on the screen. And Samantha and I were talking about this earlier. Um, you know, it's it's great that Eagle River Nature Center has reached out and made these programs available for people, and that we can see each other and and enjoy each other's company, although virtually. Um, but and that's another reason I love feeding the birds so much. It's just so so comforting during these times of uncertainty and everything that's going on. So it um, warms my heart that so many of you were here today and that you enjoy the birds and that you um, had some questions. And I hope you learned some things. I hope it um, encouraged you to maybe add to your bird feeding um, you know, selection, it, maybe do something a little different, have some fun with it and uh, enjoy those birds. Excellent. And I think on that note, um, our, our time together has come to an end. So thank you again so much. And I look forward to hearing you speak again, Alicia. It's been great. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thanks, everybody, again, for spending Sunday afternoon with us. Mm -hmm.